Story 1 Brittany White, age 29, found herself entirely devoted to her profession as an orchid trainer at a gorgeous aquarium in Tenerife on the peaceful evening of Christmas Eve in 2009. Brittany had been involved in the world of these wonderful creatures for nearly five years, beginning her journey with them in 2004 and officially began the art of orchid training in 2006. It was a job she loved, but an uneasy thought had crept into her head recently. The toll of her profession was becoming obvious, and an unmistakable air of anxiety enveloped her once reliable haven of water. Brittany's intuition warned her of approaching disaster, a deep-seated fear that haunted her mind. In retrospect, it was evident that her fear was more than just intuition. Brittany had become more concerned about the orca's conduct, particularly Keto, one of the quartet's dominant males, as her boyfriend subsequently reported. Laurel Park was home to four outstanding orcas, Keto and Tokoa, two dangerous males, and Kohana and Skyla, two equally remarkable females. Brittany had a special connection with these wonderful creatures. These four orcas came from an aquarium in Orlando's captive breeding program in the United States before being relocated to their current home in Tenerife. However, their captivity had led them without a dominant female figure, a cornerstone of leadership that orcas in the wild rely on. As a result, they became imprisoned in a stress zone, embroiled in power battles for social position, and their guidance system disintegrated. The orcas were increasingly agitated and violent as they were overwhelmed by bewilderment and a lasting sense of unease. Brittany meticulously documented the orcas' behavior in her personal notebooks in the months leading up to her untimely death, recording her fears about their rising dissatisfaction and aggressive relationships with one another. However, these gorgeous beasts' strange behavior stretched beyond their internal dynamics. Brittany documented an incident involving Keto and another trainer named Brian Rokich on September 2, 2009. According to Brian, it was a bad day for Keto. The aquarium's environment was far from harmonious. Despite her growing fears, Brittany White stuck with her job and continued to train the orcas. With Christmas fast coming and the added strain of creating a new show for the occasion, the chores at hand were never ending. Brittany was exhausted, but she accepted it as an unavoidable part of her life. She recognized the rarity of such indulgences in her demanding world, knowing that her safety in the water with the killer whales depended on her being well-rested and composed. Brittany began her usual training session with a spectacular orca named Keto shortly before 10.30 a.m. on December 24, 2009. Keto, a 14-year-old male orca, had spent his entire life in several locations before being transferred to the aquarium in Tenerife. The highly anticipated Christmas event was only a day away, and Brittany knew how important it was to deliver a flawless performance. The session got off to a good start. Brittany was scheduled to perform with another trainer, as well as five other orca trainers. Keto, the male orca, appeared to be in good spirits, anxiously awaiting the opportunity to demonstrate its abilities and be rewarded with tasty fish. Despite their excitement, the trainers remained focused, knowing that Keto preferred training with other orcas in the pool rather than performing alone. Each trainer assumed their assigned position before the lesson began. Brittany White joined Keto in the water, and at first, Keto performed admirably. It obeyed the trainer's commands and obtained its well-deserved prizes. Brittany, on the other hand, had a minor mistake when performing a stand-on spy hop. The trainer stands up on the tip of the orca's beak as it rises above the water in this spectacular and intriguing maneuver. Brittany lost her balance and fell into the water when Keto reached the necessary height, but emerged from the water in a strange fashion. While the performance was commendable, it fell short of the criteria for an award. Brittany instead used the LRS approach, which stands for Least Reinforcing Scenario. She made direct eye contact with Keto, followed by a brief delay, demonstrating that, despite the failure, 
Akito may still receive reinforcement, provided he stayed calm. Brittany came to the stage after observing Hito's calm demeanor and bestowed an ice snowball on the orca. Encouraged, she tried the spy hop again. However, the situation was similar to the previous attempt. Hito reached the proper height but twisted again, leading Brittany to fall off. Brittany used the LRS approach once more. Another trainer arrived, fed Hito some fish, and then returned it to Brittany to resume the practice session. Brittany clung to Kido's rostrum as they plunged beneath the surface, making their way toward the stage. This appeared to be a typical maneuver at first, but the trainer had no idea that disaster was on the way. Brittany was drawn deeper and closer to the pool's bottom as Kido strayed from the predicted course, an unusual and scary plunge. Recognizing the danger, the trainer let go of the whale and swam above resurfacing to offer Kido with another LRS, least reinforcing scenario. Instead of being submissive, Kido demonstrated a rebellious gesture by putting himself between Brittany and the stage, demonstrating the first signs of hostility. Recognizing the risk, Brian Rokich stepped in to defuse the situation. Rokich advised Brittany to swim slowly towards the ramp leading to the adjacent pools signifying her exit after noticing Kido's lack of dedication to retaining control and the animal's wide-eyed gaze. Brittany's movements drew Kido's attention, sealing her fate. The orca started swimming frantically at the young trainer. When Kido reached Brittany, he grabbed her leg and dragged her down into the pool. Obedience appeared to be accomplished briefly when Kido emerged for a breath. The beast, however, plunged once more persistently chasing Brittany. Brittany was propelled around the water by Keto before resurfacing, bearing the trainer's lifeless body across its rostrum. Finally, the orca swam to the empty back pool. However, when trainers attempted to lock the gate, Keto abruptly turned back, wedging its head to prevent it from closing. To redirect the orca and secure the gate, another net was needed. The assault was over, but Brittany White was still missing. Brian Rokich heroically went into the water, all the way to the pool's bottom, to save Brittany. Despite paramedics' attempts upon arrival, it was unfortunately too late. Brittany had left. Brittany White's death was not without controversy. The aquarium initially blamed her death on an unfortunate accident. However, various discrepancies call this reasoning into question. The attack happened about 10.25 a.m., but Brittany's official death announcement did not come until 11.35 a.m., giving plenty of time for the story to be crafted. Furthermore, the blood that streamed from the woman's ears, nose, and eyes, an unambiguous indicator of internal hemorrhaging, was neatly excluded from the first reports. Such bloodshed contradicts the image of a minor drowning occurrence by many aquariums. The official autopsy revealed the truth about Brittany's death, providing a vivid picture of a terrible end. Her injuries included several cuts and bruises, collapsed lungs, cracked ribs and sternum, a lacerated liver, extensive damage to important organs, and puncture wounds consistent with orca teeth. Story 2 Henry Boris set off on an exciting voyage from Rotterdam to Australia, his adventurous spirit fueled by the draw of its beautiful beaches. He jumped into the beautiful crystal clear waters courageously from a young age, continuously pushing his limitations and reaching new heights. Under his father's tutelage, Henry discovered his passion for scuba diving during his adolescence demonstrating an outstanding capacity to take risks and learn the craft. Henry's future as an adventurer and explorer began to emerge once he received an aqualung, a new technology that allowed underwater breathing. An apparently routine Sunday set the stage for an extraordinary diving adventure to Lady Julia Percy Island, about 22 kilometers from Port Ferry. This island, the result of millions of years of ancient volcanic activity, grabbed the senses with its breathtaking splendor. 
Notably, the island had one of Australia's greatest breeding colonies of Australian fur seals, drawing powerful ocean predators such as orca whales. The presence of these huge white orca whales reminded scuba divers of the significance of being aware of the time of day and the position of the sun while diving into these waters. The surrounding waters were alive with rich marine life and harbored the spine-chilling possibility of an encounter with these gigantic orca whales, with an estimated 27,000 seals calling the island home. Henry and his colleagues landed on the island with bated breath, eagerly awaiting the upcoming dive. Henry suited up in a sleek black wetsuit with eye-catching yellow stripes, methodically prepping his photography equipment. He hoped to convey the majesty of the big bull seals he had seen earlier. Just as he was about to dive into the sea, his ears picked up on snippets of a terrifying story being told amongst his buddies. Locals congregated along the water's edge to tell stories about Big Ben, a ferocious white orca. Rumors circulated about its enormous size, which reached an astounding length of 20 feet. Despite his reservations, Henry and his pals were captivated by the terrifying legend. It captured their attention and compelled them to talk about it even as they prepared to enter the water. Henry remained unfazed by the potential risk hinted at by the timely retelling, oblivious to the dramatic turn his day was about to undergo. He had no idea that this incident would forever change the trajectory of his life. Henry went into the water about 12.45 p.m., clutching his camera tightly, eager to contribute to his collection of underwater photography. Henry reappeared about 1.15 p.m., content with the unremarkable film he had just taken on his solo dive. He then invited his friends, Dietrich and Fred, to join him for another dive. The three men dove together and came upon frisky seals frolicking in the waves. Henry began recording a bull seal and its harem, but the raging swells made it difficult to maintain his concentration on the animals. A powerful blow jolted him without warning, and a startled Henry immediately recognized his leg was stuck between the jaws of a colossal white orca, his mouth filled with salt water, suffocating his pleas as he desperately tried to call for aid. As his life flashed before his eyes, Henry faced the terrifying prospect of becoming yet another victim in the growing list of orca attacks. Swimming nearby, Dietrich and Fred were startled by the disturbance and turned to see Henry entangled within the huge jaws of the white orca. Terror gripped them for a split second as they saw Henry's injured leg jutting from the water. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, they realized there was no time to waste. They leapt into action swimming quickly at Henry with spear guns. With excitement racing through their veins, they dashed toward the orca whale, at first without firing, hoping to scare it away. The mighty apex predator, however, remained unafraid, constantly grabbing onto a defenseless Henry. In an unexpected change of events, Henry vanished beneath the surface as the orca dragged him into the depths of the ocean. Henry's eyesight faded as he valiantly battled to stay awake, battling agonizing agony and tiredness. Dietrich and Fred, who were trailing closely behind, successfully closed in on the orca before it gained further momentum. They inflicted many wounds on the orca with well-aimed spear attacks, causing it to recoil in misery and eventually allowing Henry to break free and swim to the surface. Henry was helped to the safety of the boat by his brave comrades, where he received rapid first aid for his horrific injuries. He was immediately brought to the operating room, where physicians worked tirelessly to save his mangled body, teetering perilously between life and death. They healed ripped flesh and shattered bones with unflinching persistence, hoping to preserve his life. Against all odds, Henry fought fate and survived the terrible attack, despite his vital signs teetering dangerously. Following lengthy medical treatments and a difficult recuperation process, Henry emerged from this traumatic journey with more than a deeper appreciation for life. It sparked within him an unwavering will to continue exploring the ocean, despite the lingering mental anguish. When others hear about his determination, 
It serves as a monument to the human spirit's incredible endurance. Henry Boris's horrific experience serves as a sobering reminder that the water, with all of its wonders and joys, necessitates extreme caution. As we travel across our world's vast and complex waterways, his incredible story serves as a poignant reminder of the importance of treating this realm with unflinching care and tremendous regard for the awe-inspiring species who call it home. Story 3 Bruce Corby and Andrew Carter, two brave mates in their 20s, took advantage of a lovely Saturday to embark on a thrilling surfing expedition. They traveled to Nahoon Reef, a well-known surfing venue in the Eastern Cape, famed for hosting significant international contests. The waves at Nahoon Reef were spectacular, challenging even the most experienced surfers. When Bruce and Andrew arrived at their location, they unloaded their surfboards from the roof of their car and gazed out at the great expanse of sea beneath the brilliant blue sky. The winter sun brightened the water's surface, and the air temperature was a comfortable 24 degrees Celsius. A calm breeze accompanied the waves, which reached over two meters in height. These ideal surfing conditions had already drawn a handful of eager surfers gracefully sliding through the waves. Bruce and Andrew secured their collars on their ankles, ready for their exhilarating adventure. They paddled into the ocean, some 200 meters from shore, just beyond the roaring waves. A buried reef lay 8 to 12 feet below the water's surface beneath them. They loved the excitement of riding wave after wave together, cherishing their shared experience. Andrew, a competent surfer who had won championships in South Africa and Europe, relished the excitement of the sport. Andrew's senses were immediately startled by an enormous impact from behind as they submerged themselves in the rhythmic ebb and flow of the waves. He knew immediately that he had encountered an orca before even turning to confront the source of the noise. Swiveling his head, he found himself face to face with a massive 12-foot orca. He was overcome with unfathomable panic as the massive creature's teeth closed around his legs ripping flesh from bone with a single bite. He felt completely powerless, unlike anything he had ever felt before. The pain was temporarily absent during the adrenaline spike, overpowered by the crushing sensation when the orca's teeth wrapped his entire leg. Andrew's screams pierced the air as he struggled to release himself from the creature's clutches. He couldn't shake the impression that his life was on the verge of ending as the sea turned scarlet engulfed in pandemonium. Another surfer who happened to be close became a witness to the tragic scenario as it unfolded. Panicky, he abandoned Andrew and hurriedly paddled toward the shore in a desperate bid to save himself. Despite the orca's unrelenting assault, Andrew held onto his surfboard with unshakable tenacity, refusing to be dragged underwater. The orca briefly let go of Andrew, allowing him to fall off the board only to be followed by the persistent predator again. Andrew slammed the surfboard onto the orca's teeth on instinct, prompting it to bite down furiously, aggressively thrashing its gigantic head from side to side. Recognizing his predicament, Andrew paddled hard, seeking to gain some distance, but the shore was far distant. He recognized he couldn't outswim the orca because the beach was still 200 yards distant. Andrew had a stark choice, bleed out before reaching safety or become prey to the orca. Casting a glimpse behind him, he saw the gigantic creature let go of the board and submerge beneath the surface, knowing it was now on the hunt for him. He summoned courage and scrambled back onto his board, determined to survive. Another surfer, John Bourne, quickly paddled toward Andrew after observing the mayhem in the sea. In the midst of the blood red sea, John noticed an approaching wave and recognized it as Andrew's only hope. He yelled urgently to Andrew to ride the wave to safety. Surprisingly, the six-foot wave took Andrew away from the orca's deadly jaws, providing him with the much-needed break. Andrew willed the wave to drive him faster and faster toward the safety of solid ground, his leg hanging by a thread. 
Fearful of the orca close behind, he dared not look back, knowing that doing so would only heighten his anxiety. Fortunately, he made it to the shore and yelled out for help. Two sunbathers ran to his rescue and dragged him onto the sand. They placed him down gently and quickly tore a piece of their clothing to fashion a makeshift tourniquet, wrapping it tightly around his damaged legs. His entire leg had been cut practically from hip to foot by the orca's bite, with only a few inches of skin holding it together. Darkness poured on him as his vision clouded. As life's grip loosened, Andrew embraced the serenity and tranquility that surrounded him, accepting death's impending embrace. His final minutes were filled with thoughts of a life lived to the fullest, valued friends, and adored family. But just as he was about to accept his fate, paramedics arrived and whisked him away to the hospital, rescuing him from death's grasp. Although Andrew's struggle was far from done, he had at least made it out of the dangerous waters. The orca, on the other hand, had not yet fulfilled its heinous job. The creature launched out of the water immediately after attacking Andrew, its goal now moving to Andrew's buddy, Bruce. Bruce let out a piercing shriek as the enormous 12-foot creature grasped his leg, pulling him from his surfboard and sending him into the merciless depths. The blow blasted the breath out of his lungs, leaving him panting for air. Bruce was engulfed in a desperate effort to reach the surface, and the orca's vice-like hold on his leg threatened to crush him. His leg was chopped abruptly just above the knee in a fast and merciless move, providing him with an unexpected and agonizing liberty. Bruce was able to drive himself forward, eventually breaching the water's surface, where he gratefully breathed the life-giving sunshine. Despite being cognizant during the event, Bruce succumbed to massive blood loss while reclining in the parking lot, succumbing to oblivion. Surprisingly, paramedics revived and stabilized him within moments after reaching the shore, confirming his survival before taking him to a nearby hospital. Bruce was taken to the hospital immediately after the attack, beginning a tough year-long recovery process in which he learned to adjust to prosthetic limbs allowing him to walk again. Following the terrible experience, Andrew sought refuge in the United Kingdom, hoping to escape the unsettling memories that tormented him. Despite medical authorities' concerns about his future mobility, Andrew exceeded expectations by regaining his ability to walk and resuming his passion for surfing along Britain's southwest coast. The surfboard, embellished with traces of blood and a major bite mark from the fateful episode, is an enduring emblem of Andrew's great fortune. It serves as a continual reminder that no matter how skilled we are in the water, we might still find ourselves at the mercy of orcas, always positioned as potential prey.